This program is brought to you by Suffolk University. Please visit us on the web at www.suffolk.edu. My name is Emily Curran, and I'm the Executive Director of Old South Meeting House, which is, as you all must know, a museum historic site and an active meeting place here in the center of downtown Boston. I'm so pleased that you could join us for this special collaborative program between Old South Meeting House and Ford Hall Forum, which has been made possible by the Lowell Institute. Both Old South Meeting House and Ford Hall Forum share a mission to promote free speech and to present engaging and relevant program to the public and to have you engage with the outstanding panel that we have here tonight. Tonight, we're continuing that tradition with a collaborative program we've planned together about education in Boston. We will be examining some of the challenges faced by the Boston Public Schools and the hurdles ahead in developing a stronger system for Boston. And as I mentioned before, we do have an outstanding panel of speakers and a wonderful moderator to help us think about this tonight. As the parent of a Boston Public School student, I have a special interest in tonight's program. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening's program, Mr. Tessel Collins. Mr. Collins is the owner of the Spectrum Broadcasting Corporation and serves as the Director for University Business Partnerships and Extended Learning and Grant Management for Dorchester Academy at Boston Public Schools. From 2006 to 2009, Mr. Collins held the position of Senior Coordinator of Arts, Media, and Communications Technology in the Boston Public Schools Office of High School Support, Career, and Technical Education. Mr. Collins is also a board member and vice president of Ford Hall Forum. And now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator for this evening, Mr. Tessel Collins. Thank you. Renew, redesign, rethink, restructure, reinvent, revive, and reform. Tonight we will revisit the challenges and changes of reform in the Boston Public Schools with our guests. Dr. Jean McGuire has been the Executive Director of the Metropolitan Council for Educational Opportunity, METCO, since 1973. As head of METCO, the largest and oldest not-for-profit desegregation integration program in America, McGuire has become one of the most significant and outspoken leaders of the movement for quality education for people of color in the metropolitan Boston and nationally. An activist for equal education and quality teachers, McGuire was a student at Girls Latin School and a public, Boston public school teacher. Dr. McGuire attended Howard University and holds a BS from Boston State College, an MA in education from Tufts University, and an honorary doctor of humane letters from Salem State College. In 1981, Dr. McGuire became the second African American elected to serve on the Boston School Committee. George Chip Greenwich, in 1988, Chip Greenwich was the president of the senior class at Cambridge Ringin Latin School. A graduate of Morehouse College and Harvard University School of Education, Mr. Greenwich helped found Cambridge's Benjamin Banneker Charter School, which focuses on math and science education for African American and Latino elementary students. George is currently the executive director of the National Black College Alliance, a group of alumni and students of historically black colleges and universities who work with urban youth high school students to create a new generation of civic leaders. Mr. Greenwich recently launched a series of Greatest Minds Summits to get Boston black professionals more involved in the city's civic and cultural life. Since 1998, Claudio Martinez has served as the executive director of the Hyde Square Task Force, an organization that builds the skills of inner city youth through innovative arts and cultural leadership, lifelong learning, economic development, and community organizing initiatives. Under his leadership, the Hyde Square Task Force has received numerous recognitions, including the Coming Up Taller Award, 
the nation's highest honor for out-of-school arts and humanities programs given by the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities, the Best Practice Award in Teen Programming for Youth Leadership and Achievement by Boston's After School for All Partnership, and the Innovations in Education City Excellence Award. Claudio has over 20 years of managerial experience in both the private and nonprofit sectors and has served as an advisor to several governmental nonprofit and transnational initiatives, including Boston Housing Authority's Monitoring Committee, Boston University's Institute of Nonprofit Management and Leadership, and Boston Haifa NGO Learning Exchange. As a community organizer, neighborhood activist, and parent, Claudio has been involved in Boston school reform efforts for the last 20 years. He served for many years as co-chair of the Boston Parent Organizing Network and a board member of the Latino After School Initiative and the Boston Schoolyard Initiative. He sits on the boards of directors of the Boston Foundation, the Nellie Mae Foundation, and Boston After School and Beyond. He is a member of the inaugural class of the Ba Foundation Fellows Program, and in, nine, and in 2008, he was appointed by Mayor Menino to the Boston School Committee. Dr. Joseph Mark Cronin. Dr. Cronin has been a professor and dean at Harvard University, Leslie University, and president of Bentley College. He was the first Massachusetts Secretary of Education, now president of an, of an educator of education advisor services company called Advisors. Dr. Cronin was president of Bentley College and president of the Massachusetts Higher Education Assistance Corporation. He has held numerous other positions in his work as an educator over the past 43 years, including teaching in the Braintree, Massachusetts, and Palo Alto, California public schools in the late 1950s, later holding positions as high school principal, university professor, and state superintendent of education in Illinois. Recently, he has taught at Boston University and had been a senior fellow at the New England Board of Higher Education and the Nellie Mae Education Foundation. Dr. Cronin earned his bachelor's degree at Harvard College, his master's at Harvard University, and his E.Ed. doctor's degree at Stanford University. He is the author of Reforming Boston Public Schools, 1930 to 2006, Overcoming Corruption and Racial Segregation. Please welcome our panel. Just down the street from us is, on School Street, was formed the Boston Public Latin School in 1635, the nation's first public school. And we are in the shadows of two legendary buildings, 15 Beacon Street and 26 Court Street, <laughs> the homes of the Boston School Committee and Boston Public Schools. I'd like to start by asking Dr. Cronin, as we talk about the history of the Boston Public Schools, what prompted you to write this book and what did you learn that you didn't know? Well, I really began as a graduate student at Stanford University in 1968. They knew I was from Boston, so they said, why don't, <clears throat> this was a study of big city schools. And they said, why don't you take Boston? You know, they understand how you talk, you know, and you'll, <clears throat> you'll, you should do well. Uh, then I got a grant from the Danforth Foundation in the 1960s when I was teaching at Harvard to do further study of how Boston, Boston schools made decisions. And uh, so that, pretty soon I had graduate students writing papers and because uh, from 1965 on, so much happened. The racial imbalance law, the law establishing collective bargaining for, for teachers, and it's just been so exciting the last 40 plus years I, I couldn't let it go. So finally, I thought, I've got to write it down. For people new to Boston, new to the Boston schools, and Claudia and I were talking about this the other night, most people coming into Massachusetts have no idea what, what Boston schools have gone through the last 40, 50 years. So it, I just felt a sense of responsibility, uh, write it down. Most amazing things about Boston, number one, it, two years ago, it was the most improved urban school system in America. Um, 
and it had been a finalist the previous three years. So Boston schools have really, in this century, uh, come up from where only 20 or 30 percent of the kids could pass tests to where now 85 to 90 percent are pass. Second thing that's, uh, that's most uh, dramatic is that the Boston schools in the 1930s had 130,000 students. Right now there's 55,000 and surplus capacity for another 4,500, 5,000. So it's inevitable that there will be in the next two or three years the closing of another six to ten schools, possibly the lowest performing schools because that's the national pressure and state pressure to do away with schools that just aren't functioning well. Claudio, uh, when we were talking, you um, said that you were a newcomer, even though that you've been here about 20 years. Um, what did you learn from Dr. Cronin's book? Well, I was appointed to the school committee, and yes, I'm a new Bostonian, and it was amazing to have a book like yours, uh, as I was trying to really understand all the tensions that I was feeling both at committee meetings, inside the building, and also to try to understand what was the next most important thing, if we had to do one thing that will turn around uh, the schools that most needed it in our most marginalized uh, neighbors. Uh, one thing that I couldn't escape uh, noticing when I read the book, and given that I'm of Latin American ancestry, was the uh, very few uh, mentions of Latinos. <coughs> And I know that they've been around in this city for quite some time, and yet uh, it's hard uh, to see in the city streets, buildings, schools, I think we only have one, uh, that show any evidence that this community uh, is here, and today they represent 43% of the student body of the Boston public schools. And I mentioned this not uh, uh, from a complaining point of view, but I think around the world what we have been experiencing in the last few years is the massive migration of the global south to the global north. And that has created a number of very, I think, interesting, enriching, uh, but also difficult and complex problems for educational systems. When you have a monolingual, uh, bi-ethnic, system and then your city, uh, you find out, and I think we found out in the year 2000 through the census, that Boston had changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. That we, in fact, uh, Boston was a minority majority city for the first time. 51% of people in Boston were not what people like myself, before arriving to Boston, would have thought uh, the Boston population was. Mm. Uh, so, as a new school committee member and someone that had worked with thousands of kids that unfortunately the educational system had not been able to serve very well, uh, it was amazing to have uh, this, this tool to guide me. Uh, Dr. McGuire, from a pure black and white issues to multicultural, multilingual. Um, Boston is a system with a large uh, special needs population. Uh, what challenges are parents, students of the Boston Public Schools facing today? You could have very easily, you lived this book, um, but w what do you see over the last few years? It depends on how you look at me is a an old children's book that we developed a dance to when I was at one of the historically black universities. And the, what you just said about the label, special needs, has a lot to do with what we value and how we look at people. There was once this story that was brought to me by Arika Timai. She, was, she fled Hitler, Germany, went through Austria, ended up in New York and somehow became a artist in residence at Howard University in the 40s. And I was lucky to get her in a modern dance class. But she had been informed by 
the rise of the Third Reich in Europe and the, those horrors which get perpetuated ad infinitum around the world as the decades go by because we still don't know how to deal with difference uh, in many, many ways at the international and national level. And she had us do this dance about a farm that had a chicken, chicken house with hens and turkeys and chickens, geese, um, that were providing eggs for the farmer to sell. And of course, in a school system, what you sell is the idea of education of the citizenry. Not necessarily for a job, but to be a good citizen. And so these chickens had one egg that hatched, this big, ugly, ungainly, knock kneed big-footed bird with a funny-looking beak. And he was awkward in his walk, and he squawked. And he was bigger than everybody else, and his feathers didn't look right. He wasn't the right color like the rest of them. They were all pretty foul. And of course, at night, they were often locked up to protect them from the fox, as foxes like to, to you know, invade the chicken, chicken, chicken yards and get whatever fowl they could. But one night, the farmer forgot to lock the door, and the fox came in, and all the fowl ran off into the corner, clucking, ah, cluck, 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 cluck. I used to do this with my children in my class, and they loved it, and everybody had to make a sound of a chicken, a turkey, a duck, or a goose. The only one that wasn't afraid was the ugly bird. He was called the chirkin deuce. He didn't look like much of anything that was like the rest of the, the fowl. And when he stood up and he, he kind of staggered over to the fox, and the fox saw him and said to himself, oh my god, what is this? This, this big, unga it was a big bird. It was almost as big as the small foxes aren't that big. And so he lunged and staggered toward the fox, and the fox in terror ran out of the chicken yard and the chicken house. And of course, all the fowl ran around him and said, you're our savior, you've saved our lives. And, and they adulated him instead of denigrating and making fun of him and putting him down. And within two or three weeks, now that he had friends, he started to strut around the yard, and. Then one day, they came out. They were, like many farms, there was a pond. If you live near a farm, you like to have water, particularly you have ducks. And all of a sudden, this ungainly chirkindus walked down to the water, and instead of what they saw the night before, what went out and sailed away was a swan. And in a school system, there are lots of swans. They look different when they're young. They don't always do good on tests. They don't always talk good. They don't have manners like some of the other children. Uh, they, they bring in funny lunches, although now we have school lunches. And generally, they don't always fit in. And the task that we have in education is how to take the chirk inducers of the world and make them swans. And what I've seen in Boston is there are differences in governance now. Years ago, we had an elected school committee, and this is the only school committee in Massachusetts which isn't elected by the people, it's appointed by the mayor. And I assure you, the day we get a black mayor, they're gonna to want to change the form of governance and maybe go back to an elected school committee again, depending on uh, the, the population's makeup by class and race, so there's only one human race. And I, I hope you all know your people of color so that we won't be bored like the chicken deuce and the ducks and chickens with all kinds of different physiognomies in here, thank God, so we won't be bored. And the way to have a good educational system is not to be bored with the children and not to give up on them because of their test scores or maybe their behavior, but to do what we develop in these 54 colleges and universities around and in Boston and Cambridge and create future citizens with the best curriculum, the best buildings, the best resources, the meth, meth, beth, best methods that we can to create the swans of the world. Not that chickens and ducks and turkeys and geese aren't fine, but there are swans too. And since people think they're so beautiful, and you don't generally eat them for dinner and have them fried, um, it's the way you look at me 
that often defines what the outcome, outcome will be. Sometimes I look at the program that I work with. It's public education. And what used to be the farms around the great city of Boston uh, and mill towns where people made paper and uh, woolen clothes and they, um, they made shoes and they made boots for the paratroopers in World War II is now the suburbs. All those farms that were there when my, my grandfather, who married an Irish immigrant and he was an ex-slave, built on their farm, all that has changed and all the people move out there are basically in bedroom towns. They live out there, it's lovely. I uh, just came back from Lincoln, lots of nice trees, and then I say, but I have all that in Franklin Park. I've got the beech groves and I've got the hemlocks that the woolly well, adelgid hasn't killed. And I've got the Boston Public Library, the ones that are still open. And there are lots of beautiful churches like this that can remind you of our wonderful history. And I know that out there, those new residents who weren't farmers, but they're newer than what was there a century ago when Joe talked about what schools were like, they want their children to run America and run businesses and run universities. And these children in Boston and Springfield who get on the bus every day and ride like most suburban kids do to school on a bus, and a lot of Boston kids do, they go out there and they share in whatever the resources are. I don't think the teachers are any different from the teachers in here. They're just teaching parents who have power and often have more money and aren't running a capital city where half a million people drive in every day with all that that entails in terms of its strain on your police and fire department and your Department of Public Works and your Macadam and all the other things that make a great city and a capital city that has to spend about 25 cents of every dollar in education. If you go to Lincoln, it's about 60 cents or more on every dollar because they're not running a city. They're running a small, bucolic New England town. And they're in trouble. They're in trouble because the money doesn't go as far as it used to go, and everybody has to face up to what urban areas have for a long time. How do you do the best with often the least? We now have a budget that's almost double what it was when I was on the school committee, or may maybe even more than that, because when I left, it was under 400 million. What's double, it now? Double. Maybe double, maybe. yeah, it's about double. And that's, that's true in suburban towns. But this is a port city, like Philadelphia, or New York, and San Francisco, and New Orleans, and it gets all the children of all the people as far as the winds can blow, and they come here and they go to school, and they are a rich resource for us. And they are a challenge to those of us who think of ourselves as intellectuals and educators and developers of children's minds and bodies. And I think Boston has risen to the challenge in the best way it can, but it doesn't always have the maintenance of effort financially that it needs. You can't do anything today if you don't continue some of the things you did, to, you did yesterday and plan for some new things tomorrow. Boston has changed dramatically from when I was a teacher. 43 kids, 36 seats, DC current, cold water, no hot water, 1920 <laughs> Scott Forsman books, little nubbles of crayons, no white paper, yellow line paper to do penmanship, no computers, no, there was none of that stuff then. So it's changed with the world as the world has changed. I do not judge the school system by its MCAS scores because I, I really do not believe in high stakes testing. Not after our, our last presidency. You couldn't possibly say that having high test scores was what made you something desirable. Well, let's, let's get into a conversation then around this whole role of budget cuts and reform. Yeah, um, Chip, what do you see in terms of the amount of money being spent on students. You work very closely with the, the students in the school. Well, um, just to start off is um, my uh, great-grandparents and parents, uh, great-grandparents came from here in the 1900s. They came from St. Kitts and they came from Barbados. And the reason why they came to Boston, and I think um, Jean really hit it, was they believed and we were told that the streets were paved of gold. All right, and so my great-grandfather came over to work in the Netco candy factory over there in Cambridge, 
And my other grand, my great grandfather was a, a very well-known um, writer. His name was George Reginald Margotson, and I was named after him. Um, and he was a, a poet, and his books are in, um, in books at Harvard and down at Morehouse and all over, and um, worked very closely with James Wellman Johnson. I say that to talk about um, what the system of Boston Public Schools has done for uh, people of color, especially black people. And the main thing is that I have many cousins here. I have many uncles and aunts that have been a part of the Boston public school system. And in order to have a discussion presently about that, we must have the discussion about what the, what the residue of all what the Boston public schools has meant for people that have been born and raised here for years as we try to um, circle around reform efforts. Um, growing up, I grew up in the 70s. Uh, where are my 70s babies at? 70s, 80s babies. We got a couple in the room. But I mean, I grew up and I was able to watch on TV a guy with a big bald head in 1980. His name was Mel King, all right? Now, Mel was my Obama growing up. You know what I mean? Having a big man with a big bow tie be able to talk back and tell people what he wanted for schools and systems. So that really showed me um, as I was growing up how to actually think about and being active in the school systems. I've also had great mentors like Gene McGuire, um, Ken Guscott, um, and also uh, Sarah Ann Shaw who have always been out there showing us what education is. Um, and it's great also to be on this panel with um, Dr. Crowen, because I don't think he remembers, and I kind of remember that he started something called Business Week yeah. at Bentley College. And I was able to send over uh, 60 students in the 90s to attend um, Business Week over the years, where they taught uh, inner city kids how to be involved with business school and so forth. And I just want to thank you for that effort. And that's been a, one of the main reasons why a lot of kids got a taste of college in our inner cities were by being a part of that. So I want to thank you as well. And also I get to be on a panel with uh, Claudio who's been doing great work in the city of Boston. So I'm just really excited to be here. Um, but the names that I always remember were Dr. Cliff Janey, were Dr. Lois Harrison Jones, and we have a new sister that is a superintendent, but we don't talk about what happened last time with Lois Harrison Jones and Ray Flynn. Um, where they would actually battle in the paper every day. The Boston Herald, you'll tell him, he, he was talking about her, then she was talking about him, and it was a bad time for the um, Boston Public Schools and education. Also, I want, really want people to really also remember about Project Exodus, Ellen Jackson, and I was actually fortunate to be involved in growing up at the Freedom House, um, as we called it, the Black Pentagon back in the 70s and 80s, <laughs> where lots of educational reform stuff was happening in the communities. So the ways, the enemy was very different, and I bet um, people here on the panel will tell you that, is that we wanted to get, we wanted to deseg, right? We wanted that, all right? And so in the 80s, when all that work has happened, then the 90s came about, which is a different kind of period, and now we're in, the, in, in where we're at now is a, a very different how we start to look at how, who the common enemy is. Because right now we have, in the systems that we're looking around, we have a lot of black places and high places. So that's very interesting as we go forward to say who actually, have we made it to the mountaintop right now to say, okay, we can all rest and not be involved in the systems because we have a lot of people of color that are really in, in great positions of power? Or how do we even continue to push that work and go forward? So as we go forward, as we look at the schools, is that we're going to have to look at the ways that we organize each other um, on the ground level, because a lot of those main institutions, such as Lena Park, Roxbury Multi-Service Center, um, the Cooper Center, are, are poor places where people actually came to organize. And right now, um, due to the fact of um, less funding um, to those agencies, those are not looked at places where people can go. And I think a lot of the money went to the black church, but that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> well, Chip, can you kind of talk about, let's talk about voice, the voice of the students, the mm -hmm. voice of the parents, the voice of the teachers. Um, where has that gone as we're looking at reform? Part of it is language. Uh, m most school systems, particularly where there's changing populations, will have families that come in who are new Americans or don't have facility with the language of the school. And when I went to school, every junior high, because they would, or K to eight system like the old Dearborn, had Spanish, French, and Latin. 
And I, I got stuck in French and Latin. And when I got to be a teacher, half of my students were from Puerto Rico. This is going back to the 60s. 60s but I went to Puerto Rico and realized that, you know, the Latin helped me a little bit, but everybody was going to me. And I said, that's how I sound to them in the South End at the old Louise May Alcott School. I'm talking fast in English, and I had Eli Salami from Lebanon. He was from Lebanon. I had 12 students from, they were born in Puerto Rico, and some had worked in farms in New Jersey. A lot of people who come here work, work the farms around. They pick apples, they, they're out in Lexington at Wilson Farm. They work in farms, and then they move into the city. And then the Prudential was being built. Remember, that was a, that was a train yard. And so they brought in the Native Americans from upstate New York and some gypsy families. They called them gypsies. And they came to school. And I had 13-year-olds in my first grade who couldn't, they, they couldn't read and write. And they could use an abacus, though. Boy, they could, they could use money. But here, all these children were thrust upon a public school system. And often, parochial school systems would send some of them <coughs> over to us. And we didn't have the special needs category, they had what they call educable and trainable. And it's another label. That's why I don't mm -hmm. like labels. But schools have had to learn to deal with changing populations. So like New York has 104 languages in the New York public school systems, at least. And we have 62 in Boston, Brookline, and Cambridge, at least. So when you're, you're a teacher training institution, you're at Boston University School of Education, you're out at Boston College at Northeastern, you have the responsibility to help prepare the next generation of faculty for the public schools. And that's a tall order. And I don't know whether we can play catch up unless we deal a lot more forcefully with the languages of the world, not just the languages of Europe, but pay more attention to this hemisphere. Because I felt really that I shortchanged so many children because I didn't know what they were saying. I was mm. teaching the vowels, and I says E in Spanish, at least the way C. Mm -hmm. I was doing it all wrong. Well, as what we're looking at, as I'm saying, in terms of the voice yeah, of the teachers, were, yeah. we now have a situation where they've gone from historically having no voice to having a union now that's having its own school. So the teachers have really come full circle, haven't they, Dr. Corner? Yes. <clears throat> the uh, collective bargaining uh, laws of the uh, 1960s really empowered teachers. Teachers always wanted to have a say about picking the uh, textbooks, uh, getting supplies, um, being consulted by the superintendent. And way back in the 1920s, briefly, that there was a flurry of involvement. But during the Depression, World War II, it really washed away. But beginning in the 1960s, Boston teachers looking at New York City and the triumph of the uh, UFT uh, decided to go down, down that trail. Now <clears throat> teachers, organized teachers, have a major say. They have a say as to whether or not a school can become a pilot school. Uh, well, they're certainly this week complaining about working extra hours without any, any compensation. They've uh, denounced uh, the race to the top, I think, in, in part because of the Central Falls, uh, Rhode Island dismissal of a, of a high school yeah. faculty. That's uh, the... Uh, right. It's, it, it's a nightmare for, uh, for teachers. And it probably is incorrect to say that a teacher's dismissal would be dependent on one test score a year. That's a big, big, big mistake. Even the Educational Testing Service says that there should be multiple measures of identifying progress because uh, a number of kids can be sick or absent on a day and there's no way to uh, uh, catch up. But teachers today have tremendous <laughs> voice. Um, and sometimes it can be a voice for progress, uh, but other times it can be a voice to uh, slow, slow things down. And the, the nation's becoming very impatient with, with schools. Um, George Bush put a No Child Left Behind. Annie Duncan last week said there'll be a new name but they're going to keep achievement testing, and they're going to keep working on the minority achievement gap, which is 20 to 40 points in Boston and Lawrence and Lowell and, and elsewhere. Because one th good thing about it is it shows that we have not 
achieve the promise of equal results in urban education? Um, Mr. Martinez, um, from looking at Dr. Cronin's book, we can very well see that Boston is a very well studied um, system from the Boston Compact to the Boston Plan for Excellence to the Annenberg <coughs> Reports. Um, have we really learned anything from all these um, reports and studies? I should say that I am a very unlikely a school committee member. I uh, do not have a formal education. Uh, for political reasons, I was uh, kicked out of <laughs> high school in my country of origin at age 14, and I never came back. Uh, some people describe me as the testy and educated school committee member. Uh, but I'm actually uh, quite proud of the fact that I was able to educate uh, myself with the help of a lot of loving uh, people, some who were close to me and others who were not. And I want to go back a little bit to the mention of Mel Keen, because I, I arrived in this country in 1984. And just by coincidence, because somebody found me at the Boston Commons across the street, I ended up in a house that happened to be the center of uh, the Rainbow Coalition movement. And I had never not only seen, but not even imagined that uh, a group of such diversity could exist and could be talking about what I, as a kid, uh, dreamt of the future of the world. Everyone, despite their ethnicity, uh, coming together uh, to share. And I don't think I could have gotten that education in any university in this city. And for that matter, uh, today, I don't believe in the Boston public schools. We teach any of this history. And I'm quite uh, you know, offended and concerned because uh, at the end of the day, um, I certainly don't have um, intelligent opinions about education methodologies, but I know one thing uh, by working with a lot of the young people in our city, and is that they don't see themselves reflected uh, in uh, the learnings, in the schools, uh, in the cities, and that is a huge huge uh, issue. In terms of uh, what I learned from the book, and uh, I do not trust uh, many studies because, uh, <laughs> maybe because of my lack of education, I only believe in primary research mm. and not secondary research. So when I read a book and I need a study, I go to see it. And I have to tell you, even the best Harvard studies, when I go to see it, I learn that uh, they are not uh, true. Uh, many times. So um, what I, uh, I loved about uh, uh, Dr. Cronin's book, uh, uh, particularly around, and you talk about the Boston Plan for Excellence and the involvement of the business uh, community, which is a very powerful uh, force uh, that I think has had uh, very positive impacts and sometimes not so very positive impact. Well, how has the role of the um, business and philanthropic communities changed over the years? Chip? I think uh, I, I used to work at the Boston Foundation um, under um, a, a, one of my favorite mentors, um, Anna Faith Jones. Um, so I was there four years as a program officer. And one thing that I've seen especially is that um, at one time in the city, we had over, I guess, a good 15 or 16 banks um, that were very instrumental in supplying jobs and supplying resources and, and grants and resources to um, the Boston Public Schools. And now, as you look around today, there are only two or three banks that are le left um, from all the mergers and acquisitions and so forth. And so there was a, a number of dollars and resources that were available 15 years ago, which are not available now. Um, and so as we see that and we see the shrinking of dollars, we think of the shrinking of resources and jobs and um, support for our young people um, for our summer jobs. And, you know, you have to also look at the work of the Boston PIC um, of being able to provide lots of jobs for a lot of kids out there and how that actually has um, shrunk um, through the, um, the, the shrinkage of banks and certain businesses and so forth. Dr. Cronin? Tessel, the major change over the last 20 years has been that national foundations have come in and helped us out in Boston. The Annenberg 
Foundation, the Carnegie uh, Corporation, the Gates, uh, Gates, Fund, Gates yeah. uh, under Tom Bezant, with the help of Alan Guiney and others, a hundred million dollars of, of our philanthropic money has has, has come in. Now, uh, uh, 20 years ago, and Alice Jellin and myself were on the board of the Nellie May uh, of, uh, Foundation. Uh, we were going around with uh, tin, tin cups trying to uh, get the uh, John Hancock and, and the Shamit and all the other banks to come up with a, units of $100,000. Really, big money has come in, and it's, it, that's been the discretionary money uh, needed to leverage improvements in the Boston schools. Really, that $100 million has had a majestic effect. I, I think of Nellie May, for example, putting a million dollars into the training of math teachers at the middle school level. And then a few years later, the math score is moving from 20, 30 percent up to 60, 70, 80, 80 percent. Dramatic improvements leveraged by uh, philanthropic contributions. Uh, what is the legacy of Thomas Paisan, Ellen Guiney, and Tom Menino? Uh, Claudio, did you, you were on when, as, as he was leaving, I think? Uh, did you have the last year? You, no, first year? no, 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 I entered with uh, the new superintendent, oh, Dr. Okay. Carol Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We also talk about the Wilson years. Is that, was that his name, Wilson? Who was the uh, superintendent? Yeah. 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 If we can talk about the Wilson yeah. years, the Harrison <laughs> Jones years as well, I think okay. that's a good, healthy question to go through theirs. As well. Okay, so we're going to talk about the time before Tom Paisan. Lois Harrison Jones. Lois Harrison Jones, yeah, Bud Spillane. Well, Bud. Bud is now um, <laughs> Bud is now superintendent for the USAFI, the United States uh, Army Air Force Schools. Mm -hmm. I manage him on Beacon Street. He's in charge of the government schools. He left Fairfax County, and then he, oh, he was, left was there. Then he was with uh, uh, another group and, and helped staff the Appalachian Lab. He's re he just retired. He did retire. When I met him a year or two ago, he said he was working uh, with the schools that educate the children of the Army and the Navy and yeah, the Air yeah, Force. European well, let me ask this question. From if whole I school may, change Cecil, to the... If I may comment on your question as well, a father of a son that grew up under Dr. Paisan's okay. uh, tenure in the Boston Public Schools, I, I will think that everyone agrees that Dr. Paisan's uh, tenures brought uh, a great number of innovative uh, initiatives. Uh, the support, um, as, as Dr. Cronin was explaining, of the business community that really trusted him, I believe, and, and was able to, to do a lot of new things. And uh, I, what I always appreciated about him was he himself gave a C minus uh, about his performance regarding community and pattern involvement. And I will add student involvement as well, which are areas that I hope in the near future we start addressing. And because you were talking about voice, and I interpreted your question about where is the voice of the people, mm -hmm. uh, and those are to me the students in these conversations. And I believe that they have been absent. And I believe that maybe in comparison, <laughs> as I was preparing for this very humbling and, and challenging task of sitting here with this amazing panelist. I watch uh, the Eyes on the Prize video, particularly uh, the segment of Boston and the segregation. And, uh, and Jim McGuire, of course, was uh, there being interviewed. But as I was uh, thinking uh, about tonight, I was wondering how much more powerful the schools could be if we truly start engaging students and giving them the voice and some decision-making uh, power in the near future. I'd like to invite folks to begin to come up to the mic so we can take some questions from the audience. Um, we do have about another 35 minutes to uh, talk here tonight. Um, so if you have a question, please come up to the mic. Keep your questions very short. Ask your question. If you're going to ramble a little bit, I'll let you ramble a little bit, but then I don't want to be rude, but I will cut you off. Um, before we go on, I have another question that has more to do with residency and reform. Um, there's a whole history of um, folks leaving the city, uh, folks working in the city that don't live in the city, 
that will have a very strong opinion about Boston Public Schools. They'll work and take the money from the Boston Public Schools, but they'll live in another city. Is there any comment or criticism? We're talking about job residency. Job residency. Not the teachers per se, because well, that would be hard. Well, 75%, according to Dr. Uh, Cronin, 75% of Boston of public school workers were loyal to schools other than the Boston Public School. 50% 50, 50 of the teachers and principals lived outside of Boston. That's right. And of those who lived in Boston, half of them used uh, parochial and schools. private schools. That's right. Uh, one of the things I was looking for was who's loyal yeah, okay. to the uh, school system. So where is the loyalty? Chip? You can some, with Jim? There's been some examination of that. And as you were talking, Joe, I, do you remember the Stray Report and the Sergeant Report? That's yeah. right. Y you all should read that. Go. <laughs> the Stray Report, which is analysis of the whole Boston school system, and the Sergeant Report. It's summarized in the book, but it was totally ignored at the time. That's Shelf. right. I, I, I had it as well for comparative education, looking at schools in Europe and, and private schools and the Archdiocesan schools. And then Peter Schrag a wonderful journalist who wrote a book called Village School Downtown. It was about a lot of school systems, but it was mostly about the Boston public schools, and he talked about the education of the teachers, and it just happened my second time around. I went to State College at Boston, which the year I went was the first year it was a state college and not a, just a teacher training institution, but I took education there my second times around. And I think of other books, around Al Shanker's time, Village School Downtown? That was Peter Schrag. Peter Schrag. I, I mean, up, um, up the Down Staircase, after Peter wrote, as a teacher in New York wrote about up the Down Staircase. You know the kids, you tell them go up this way, down. you have the kids do the reverse, and how do you deal with that as a teacher? Then one of our Boston teachers from, from the Trotter School wrote a book called Black Teachers on Teaching, Dr. Michelle Foster. She's a professor out at University of California. And my favorite idea of loyalty to any school system in which you work was the, the statement of, he's, I think he's what you would call one of the poet laureates of Turkey, his name is Nazim Hikmet. And he had a letter to his son where he tells him, don't live in this world like a renter. Don't teach like this child you have, this child or these children you have before you won't marry one of your children, live next door, be on the other side of the bank table when you're trying to get a loan, fly in your plane, drive in your bus, uh, being your surgeon, your nurse, changing your deep ends when you're old. You have gotta think about the, the, the role of the citizen, which is the main focus of any institution of government is to prepare the next generation of citizens. And I say that because in this public library here, I never forgot in 1944, when did Patton go from Europe? Yep, 44. 44. I was at girls' Latin school, left the Dearborn. Mm -hmm. And my father told us, don't go to the public library this month, because that's what we studied. And she said, go to Parker Hill Branch. And for two or three days, my sister and I said, why do we have to do that? They don't have any stuff over there. I mean, you know, they had more stuff downtown. So we went to the Copley Square to the public library. And there were these long lines of people. And they were ropes with velvet like you have in a bank. And people were going up and down and then up the stairs and into the front. They didn't have the McKim building then. And inside, I guess General Patton and many of the commanders had brought back the artifacts from Bergen-Belsen, Dachau, Lidice, and all the other horrible places developed under the Third Reich. And once you got in that line, you couldn't get out. And I thought of all the things that a person who educates children needs to do, is to make certain they hold any other human being in the highest estimation they could as they do themselves. Y your role as a citizen is to create citizens of the world, not them and us, but that in our school, where in my class I was the only black girl at girls' Latin school, that has changed, and I'm sorry that now um, 
the issue of testing and, and how, I didn't take a test to get in Latin school. That came after Judge Gary. That was to me the punishment of the minority community. We went to girls' Latin school and boys' Latin school because they were segregated by sex. Thank God Judge Gary put the boys and girls together because they're going to live together <laughs> as grown-ups. And we, we, we have to be able to conduct ourselves in a way that we have the utmost respect for each other, the utmost respect for our teachers, the utmost respect for the role the role that the Romans had for the senators. You've got to give back to your, your town, your city, your state, your country, not just as soldiers, but as citizens. And we had a strong sense then, after coming from that, my sister had nightmares after going through there and seeing the piles of hair that they stuffed into mattresses and the baby's teeth that they melted into lamps and the, the lamps of human skin and the pictures of the pits in Lidice that you knew why you studied, why you had to learn. You must have children motivated with something that makes them want to learn for the rest of their life, whether it's to know about the fauna and flora and what the leaf, and I told everyone, look at, look at the buds now. Look at the color of the buds. What are they gonna be like in the fall? Do you remember? Anybody in the 4-H clubs ever? Anybody <laughs> here ever in 4-H clubs? We've lost a lot of good things. Yeah. The buds, the colors of the buds are the, are the colors of the leaves in the fall. I learned that at Dearborn School. And we had teachers in the city schools that were probably able to give more than where we moved around when my father was in I left Canton and Stoughton and came to Boston. Boston had other languages and had cooking and it had an orchestra. And in, in, in the times when you had the WPA, the David A. Ellis School, which had one floor, had artists who were out of work walk through our school and play music. And I can tell you how a student can be turned on to learning just by one thing. You don't know what it'll be. It could be sports, it could be shop, uh, it could be um, a sewing class, it could be being in a play, it could be staying after school because you were bad now the teacher gave you a lot of attention. And this man walked up and down our school on Walnut Avenue. Most of the population was Jewish then. There were a few blacks, Mel Mill and all of us lived around uh, Lower Roxbury. And he stood over me and he played the intermezzo on what I call this wooden box. I didn't know it was a violin. And I melted. Intermezzo. I mean, it was like silver music just spilling out over my head. And he didn't move. He played the whole intermezzo over my head. And I went home, Mama, I gotta get this music box. It wasn't until I got to the Dearborn in the eighth grade that I got money for music lessons. We didn't have money for that. We had a piano at home. But a person who represents the governing body of a school or a university has to make certain that they keep that base of liberal arts in, along with all the professional things you learn, engineering, nursing, medicine. You must have a good liberal arts program that brings you language and music and art and how to get along together, how to understand the differences are marvelous, so you won't be bored. Chip? I, I have to get off my, I grew up before television. <laughs> my children had none in the house. Well, it's amazing. I mean, I watch my niece now, and um, remember, we used to have three channels, or five channels, mm -hmm. but now uh, my niece has oh, over 500 channels oh, yeah, to watch yeah. TV from, so education is very different. Um, it's interesting, when I went to school in Atlanta, um, when I went to college, I would talk to my, um, my good friends from um, Detroit and talk about their high school experiences and my friends from Philadelphia. And they would be very varied from what my friends in the Boston Public Schools would um, feel. Um, one thing is that um, a good friend of mine went to a school called Cast Tech, all right? Cast Tech in Detroit. And they would talk about um, the bands and the, and the dance classes and, and arts and music that would happen at two o'clock, how school would just begin. But it's interesting in the Boston public schools in the 80s and 90s is that the minute that two o'clock hit, students would run out the door, all right, to get back to their own houses um, in their own parts of town. So I tried to think back to the 70s or the 60s and 70s where schools were part of communities 
uh, where people actually stayed and, and parents knew um, of the teachers and there were some kind of institutional pieces where people were involved inside of the schools and so they were part of the community fabric. And with the um, push of busing onto the schools um, has kind of eroded the, some of the community pieces um, even uh, of, of what building what community was. Um, the second thing I really wanted to just point, point really home is about people's um, interactions with government. Um, as someone um, born and raised here, and also family on both sides of the river of Cambridge, I call Cambridge of Oz, because um, <laughs> it's uh, very interesting what goes on over there. But you have to look at people's um, historical interactions with the police, historical interactions with the city hall, historical interactions with school committees, and so forth. Uh, I remember in 1989, I was living with my dad on Mission Hill, and I remember he, um, I talked about I wanted to come home for, um, for Thanksgiving because that's when we always go, 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 would go watch the uh, football games at the high schools, um, we'd go around. And this is October 1989. And my father told me, Chip, do not come home. And I asked why not to come home, and I had to remember that the Carol Stewart murder happened in Mission Hill. Oh, yeah. All right? And they searched my son. They my father said, Chip, they're searching everybody. Yeah. You stay in that Atlanta. Is this is no place for you right now. And so you have to think about the residual stuff that leaves on people of color here, born and raised in the system of, of the Boston, of, of Boston about, about how systems have systematically um, dehumanized people. And so those stories do transfer down and come down and down, and those things are always going to be always in the back of our mind. Well, let, and, me, ask, let me ask you a question um, around that. And, and it does, it is a little bit more positive around what is the expansion of opportunities that we've had now over the years for races in Boston? And I, I do encourage, please, uh, come on up to the mic and we can get you a question. I just say it could have been Judge Gertner. I thank goodness for uh, the seven year case that ended up. Um, as a part of a number of federal cases. We had to clean up the harbor. We had to integrate the police department, the fire department, civil service, public schools, and public housing. Boston has, uh, housing. that's why I said Reed Village. Housing. Peter Schrag said in Boston, you don't know where the Yankee bones ends and the Irish flesh begins and the black skin and a Latino voice and the Asian eyes. He didn't get to the hair. But he said Boston is an amalgam, like he always talked about Port Cities. Well, uh, uh, there's a richness of populations coming in, and nobody tells it better than Byron Rushing. His sense of the history of Boston, and Washington Street is old Indian Trail. It goes all the way down to Rhode Island in New York. Mm -hmm. That's the old, it was the only highway. And if you go over to the governor's mansion in Dorchester, right off of Dudley Street. And that's Roxbury. That's, well, that, that part they call Dorchester. It's near the bay. You the can see the, the, the shelves. Yeah, the post it, office may call it I know, Dorchester, I know, but I it's know. still Rock Springs. But like what Green. you see there, if you have never been to the, the British governor's house in Dorchester, Roxbury. Thank you. In the, in, they look like this building right here. It's this kind of architecture. In the foyer, or the, like we would not call it the living room, is a painting of... Dorchester Bay, looking back to the three, the Tremont, three mountains, and all the sails and all the, this was a port city. And, and, and through the years, if you look at the harbor and how it built up and the quays were built, you can see how the back bay and all of this was filled. And these were big mountains, and they chopped them down and filled in all where we're sitting now. We, we built Harvard University to educate the priests, the clergy. Those were the powers that be in the colonial days. But in this governor's mansion, you can see old Boston in this long painting. And we take students to see there. The shells are still there because the sand is still there. That was the beach. And the overlay of old, I was in the oldest building in Boston, the Louisa May Alcott, built in 1842. And I go out to Louisa May Alcott's house in Concord, and I've read all her books. But there's, there, are new, there are new ways of doing things, but the old tasks are still there. Your generation, um, 
You can do things with your thumbs. You're going to get arthritis young. <laughs> What's kids, your question, man? The kids can do things we couldn't do. No, absolutely, and they're at an unbelievable advantage currently, not only you know, as maybe paid interns or unpaid interns, but obviously in the future workforce. Um, my name's Lynette Correa, and I'm the first in my family to have a high school diploma. Wow. First to go from O'Brien High School. I'm a Boston Public School alum. Um, first of four. What and high all, school? All of my siblings went to Boston Public School. What high school? O'Brien High School, oh, Boston John Tech. Oh, Andy O'Brien, Boston School Committee. Yeah, and first in my family to go to college. I went to Leslie University, and I'm the first in my family to have a successful business. I own um, a student career coaching company called Career Coaching for Kids. And being sort of having the personal perspective of being in Boston Public Schools and now the pro professional perspective and being uh, in front of Boston Public School students currently, I still find that the graduation rate is still at 50%, which is very, disturbing for me to even say that and sit here in front of you and, and, and say that. If you were to dream a little bit and have a magic wand, what would be reforming Boston Public Schools, whether at the elementary, middle, or high school level? Dr. Crum? And that's for any one of you. Well, I want to give uh, Claudio the first cut of that since okay. he's in a position to do something about it as a member of the school committee. So, <clears throat> let me, so let me go back uh, to the question of education for what? And then the comment from Ms. McGuire about, I would say quality of life. About but. quality of life, creating the next generations of citizens. Yeah. Uh, it may be hard to believe, but three years ago I went to see the mayor and the superintendent with a group of 15 teenagers, all from Boston, all Boston public schools. They told the mayor and the superintendent that the Boston public system did not offer civics education. I'm talking about a plain civics education class. That's true. Your president, your senate, your electoral mm -hmm. system, that will be the basic. And then if you move it, a school committee, if you go more local uh, to it, uh, I was very surprised uh, that the kids were so persuasive that both uh, Dr. Johnson and Mayor Menino agree to start a civics education class. Now, the students had another one. <laughs> and they say, thank you, that's great, but we want to write the curriculum <coughs> because we are afraid that your curriculum writers have never lived the lives that we have. Mm -hmm. And we want to work with them uh, to share this experience. So they spend the whole summer, and actually uh, Madison School and English High right now are piloting for the last two years this civics education curriculum that is uh, very unique. But how can you ask the residents of your city, your state, your country to become uh, uh, active uh, citizens if they do not have uh, any idea? Two points to me, civic engagement, we must, this is the country that the rest of the world looks to see if the experiment of democracy will survive or not. The whole world looks at this country, and particularly at this city, and we must have that. The other that was mentioned before is we need to figure it out how to create opportunities a menu of opportunities for our students to find their passion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Passion about something, it doesn't matter what it is. Once they find their passion, then you can throw the other things around, math, reading, writing. And, um, and so if I could affect any change uh, in my time as a school committee member, will be to develop a real student-centered, personalized type of curriculums and teachers that is not limited to the teachers, but to everyone in the system, every administrator, every person that is in the schools, every person that is in central office. Versus will teaching understand. for the test. Yes. <laughs> I think getting, else? Get, getting the uh, graduation rate from 50% up to 90% would be a would very be, yeah. worthy goal. Not mm -hmm. only that, the good news about Boston is that 70% of the graduates of high school go on to college. So the bad news is that four years later, only about 20% of them have stayed the course. Many have had to take remedial courses, yeah. <clears throat> and that's a betrayal. Just, no, They've just got to do better. I mean, the schools have got to do better in terms of aligning the curriculum with the requirements of, uh, 
of the colleges and universities. I'd, I'd like to throw out at least uh, and get Chip's uh, opinion on this, and as well as Claudio. Um, the Boston Public Schools is very focused on college for everyone, um, but we're in a situation now where we're talking about high unemployment, need for jobs and financial security. Um, in Dr. Cronin's book, we did kind of get into this topic of vocational education and career and technical education. Where is the reform effort in the areas of apprenticeships and jobs and careers in um, the trades? Uh, go ahead. I think it's not significant enough yet, and I believe it has to do with a larger national... Okay. Yeah, you can ask. Okay, as soon as he finished, you come right to you. Take the, um, There's a whole national discourse about this, Take which the is the way to move from the lower, low-income class to the middle class is through higher education. Well, I will argue that not so. Uh, in fact, I believe right now, for example, you mentioned the Puerto Rican community mm -hmm. and other uh, uh, Latino community members are moving from low-income to the middle mm -hmm. class actually through blue-collar jobs. Uh, jobs. Uh, they become uh, good at a particular trade, then they become contractors, they start small companies, and if you look at where the new immigrant communities around New England are concentrated, you see a pattern that, uh, you know, the, the discourse of higher education uh, as the only vehicle uh, is not adding up, at least in my opinion. So why, so why don't we see more of an emphasis on that in the Boston Public Schools? Let me give some, a quick statistic. When I finished high school, 80% of graduates, 80% of the eighth grade did not go on to high school. Uh, the AFL and the CIO also found that most of their workers, many of them who were skilled around the country, like in Detroit in the automobile industry or in the shipbuilding industry in New London, Connecticut, there were, there were jobs for them that did not require the level of education that a knowledge society requires. They said, was, we were building, we sh I mean, I look at my clothes, what does it say? Men in China or where, where Sri Lanka? What does it say? China. China. Hong China. Kong. Hong Kong, okay. <laughs> the jobs that were in Brockton, the shoes, the, the, the raincoats, the paper, Eaton Mills out in the West, of Route 2, all that's gone. All, we have a, we've let people be patriotic by shipping the businesses to somewhere else. But, we, that, but we still have plumbers. We still oh, have electric. We still do, but where do they, who broke the back <clears throat> of the plumbing union of, of, of the, um, the union that does the, 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 the roads, the, the big equipment? You look at it and you see how many women. You see, we had women in construction, WIC who tried to get women into unions through the, 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 it's the, it was the Hubert Humphrey Center, now it's Madison Park. You look at who's taking plumbing. We built a school, you can't even get trucks in the doors so you can learn truck repair. Our, our school can't do that, suburban schools can. There are a lot of things for which we have not moved to this, this century's need for trained laborers. You don't have to go to college alone to be an educated person. You've got television, you've got libraries, you have all kinds of magazines. There's more than one way to skin the goose, and we shouldn't look down on the path of adult education. Uh, I don't know how many people go and look at our schools, because we don't have much money now for night high school and stuff. We use, this, this is something you raised. Why do schools just go from, say, 7.30 to 2 o'clock? Why can't schools do like New York? and have schools that operate in the afternoon and evening. Some kids don't even wake up good until about 1 o'clock. I well, know. You know. Actually, Chris Gabrielli is being honored <clears throat> a couple of blocks away at the Roxy for his a partnership with the mayor to create after-school programs. Absolutely. Hundred, uh, hundreds of them well, in no, Boston, Night which and is, afternoon which high schools. Uh, people who have parents <clears throat> who are going to work with you in the hospitals, they're not home from the 3 to 11 shift. Well, I think, I think that what we're going to have to do is get the unions and the teachers unions to buy into all of these they things. But let's York. get this young lady yeah. to have her question. Yeah. Yes. Well, my, what? Excuse me? 
Uh, my education is as a Shakespearean, and I have been a Harlem school teacher by choice. Uh, I'm an admirer of Mr. Randolph and consider myself a student of Bayard Rust. Uh, I also was uh, active in the UFT, uh, partly because I think the UFT was uh, interested in improving the education of children and I was happy to be part of a struggle for experimental schools, uh, and I taught him one of them. Um, and I, I think uh, that there are a couple things that haven't been said tonight and which are, are not part of, of the national debate uh, as about education as I hear it. Um, what, do you have a question? Uh, my question is a response to a couple of my ideas, which I will just mention briefly. As long as you keep it short, because we only have about 10 minutes left. So if you do have a question, <laughs> I'm not going please. I'm going to go on go indefinitely. Ahead. Okay. I, I thought it would make some yeah, go ahead. For sense for me to say something about who I am, what my experience sure. is. Um, but uh, I, I've heard nothing about books and mm. reading them tonight. Not enough about education, it seems to me. Um, I, I not only treated my students with respect, I think, but with uh, affectionate concern uh, while urging them uh, to Im Im improve and work harder. And, um, it, and I filled my classroom with books that I bought. It seems to me that our classrooms should be filled with the most uh, literate and lively and interesting books we can find. Um, I, I think that right now we do have to look at the, but, the, the situation where we do have books, we do have computers, we've moved into a very strong technological I don't think environment. What I'm talking about she's, she's is talking done. About something different. I'm not talking about textbooks. No. Uh, teachers are, are, are not ur urging their students to read as part of their homework every night. I've never heard of it except in my classrooms. Uh, I had principals who were shocked by my doing this and said, oh, you don't have to do this. But uh, I, I had students who began to study Greek mythology because they wanted to. This is a Latino little girl. Another student who said, Mrs. Jacobson, I don't know what's happening to me. I'm not watching television anymore. But I also think that something should be said for teachers and the way they are treated. Not only students uh, who are often treated with contempt. So I think in our schools are teachers. Uh, to a degree that is simply unrecognized. Um, and teachers need to be encouraged to show uh, respect, uh, affection, uh, concern for the work of their students. Uh, and that, that is a much better program than frightening them to death as teachers are now being frightened. Um, okay, well, thank you, ma'am. Um, can we talk about this, what she's talking about with I, the literature I, I, piece? I'm thinking of Angela's Ashes and Frank McCourt. Uh, I think, I don't know any schools where teachers don't require reading because that's absolutely essential in, in, in curriculum now. What is missing, I think, is, is the ability to have uh, more library resources within a school. This is in smaller classes where teachers can give more time to the student. There's a big difference between two student teachers and 20 students at Shady Hill and Independent School in Cambridge and a teacher who's by the union contract has to start with 25 and maybe, I mean, we didn't have teacher aides when I was there. All I got was the bookmobile books and then uh, they stopped them. Before, yeah, the book, we had bookmobiles. We got 30 books every month from the bookmobile for our school, each teacher, and then they stopped it. And then the, I took the children to the Boston Public Library after school with a letter from their parents. I almost lost my job because I didn't get credit, I didn't get permission from Beacon Street. I wanted all my kids to have a library book card. I must say, looking at the curriculum materials, there is lots of good literature. What 
and there's Kindles and all kinds of other books. Uh, what's, I don't know all yeah. the names, of, but there's, there are well, lots of portable books you can, you have to know what to pull up. Well, one of the things right. that has happened over the there last 10 reading. years with reform in the Boston Public Schools is all of, the public, all of the libraries now have been brought to the Boston Public Schools and the students can use their um, no, library not, She's talking about a school library like we had at the Monroe Trotter. I mean, a real library well, with a librarian that helps the teacher. No, but you have to... You have to have the resources somewhere. Okay. You young need man. them somewhere in yeah. the building, though. They have to be... Another question. There you go. Uh, my question is, uh, research shows that uh, students of color, especially black and Latinos, uh, get uh, expelled, suspended, and um, placed in special need classes at a, at a different, higher rate than um, their, their pair of uh, white oh, students. Yeah. Are there any reform in how we discipline um, some of our kids in class, of, and how, um, in particular to, like, you know, the curriculum, and, and maybe, uh, you know, people that come more from the South and the Caribbean islands are, uh, relate to different learning environments. Um, is there any... I think that's why we go to college and why we have um, student teaching and I think teachers need at least two years with a master teacher before they're thrown on their own in a classroom. I really feel that there's so much you have to learn and I know now that some schools have videos of excellent teaching that they can look at in their spare time. But you raised an issue about how you look at them. Remember the Turk and Deuce? If you look at the kid as a misfit, or a, 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 if, you, if in your mind comes thug, hood, all those negative names, the media does a job on, on, on different populations. And I, I don't even want to talk about the media here because that's another whole area, but it does impact our children's lives. Sure. And in, if you do a, 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 an exercise with your teachers, you put certain words on the board or you say certain words and you write down immediately what comes to your mind. Then you begin to see how society, even for the best of us, has colored our thinking with stereotypes, right. um, hurtful kinds of hopes for people. And, and I think you find them, uh, teachers if, are more likely to not want to deal with that and, and, and not know the background. If you give teachers and, and, resources, right, right. There's, there are times when you have children that, you, that need help. There are other things in the school besides teachers. There's school nurses, there's counselors, there's school social workers. Schools aren't just teachers anymore. I don't think they ever have been Jump in, for a Chuck. long time. And I just want people to know there, there are a large amount of black and Latino kids that have this system down where they are very clear in their middle school years. They know how to growl or scream at a teacher, and they know that teacher will leave them alone for the rest of the year, mm -hmm. all right, because that teacher is scared that that kid's going to growl at them. So therefore, that kid says, ha. I'm able, not to, I'm able to get away of not doing a certain amount of work because I have this teacher under this command that I'm going to get at him. And so we need teachers, as, uh, as Ms. McGuire was saying, is that we need teachers that are able to actually understand what the urban classroom is. And if you need two years under your belt to understand how to not to take that, that take a certain situation from that kind of student, that's when we're able to start looking at um, how kids are actually being labeled. So if a, if a new teacher comes in and says, oh, you're being disrupted, throw them out the class, that's immediately, and that's how kids are not actually being able to um, stay inside the schools. Let's get this one next last question as we're getting into the end. Hello, thank you now for a very interesting discussion and a great <laughs> panel. I haven't heard a word about charter schools or magnet schools or whatever. What, what's the impact, Ben, and what do you envision as a future impact, if any? <clears throat> well, there's a lot. <clears throat> thank you. There have been several research reports come out that in the past year or so some of them saying that those students who are admitted to charter schools are doing better, even scoring a year or two ahead of twins or siblings or <clears throat> cousins who applied to a charter school and did not, did not get in. Just as Metco has, has been an amazing uh, success story with 3,300 3, students a year, 10,000 on the waiting list, there's 10,000 Boston kids who want to be in a charter school. Uh, the governor and Secretary Revo <clears throat> have not been that enthusiastic, but when Obama and Duncan said, if you want, <laughs> want to get race the top money, you've got to lift the cap. We're going to see another 5,000 uh, Boston kids in charter schools <clears throat> two or three years from now because of the change in the law. Yeah. It's really going to take off. I, well, has it I been a helpful impact? <clears throat> I think overall. Uh, well, I didn't give yeah. your opinion. 
Um, as, a, as a school committee member, I can tell you that financially the money that goes out from a public system into a charter public school system. hurts uh, public school. systems yeah. a lot. I am not uh, pro or against charter. However, in my opinion, charter schools, at least in Massachusetts, have yet to prove that they can educate special needs and English language learners. I believe that for the first time now, after the recent pass of the new education law, <coughs> which expanded the cap for charter schools, there is a mandate for them to recruit this population that in the last 10 years it's actually, uh, yes. Yeah. So when a charter school has a problem with discipline, uh, they will fire the kid from the school. Guess where yeah. that kid is going to end up? Back in the Boston Public Schools. So, thank you, sir. Thank you. I might say that charter schools were part of the Southern strategy uh, during the seven years of the of Brown versus the Board of Education. You need to understand where charters, school choice, tuition tax credits, mm. vouchers all came from, not to support the improvement of the common <laughs> school, the public school, but to have these little cul de sacs where those who were knowledgeable or those who had connections could either have an all-white school or an all-middle-class school. You have to be very careful the role of the public school in creating the next generation of citizens who respect each other. There's no place like a good public school. And I'm not saying charter schools can't be good schools. And they are public schools. They are public schools, but the issue of governance is one that they have to take everybody. And that's expensive. And I think Unless you take what comes through the door, whether it's in your neighborhood Charter or on the bus. get students through the lotteries. Yeah, they get them through lotteries, but it's not like everybody. And your, I what, can tell you, a lot of the kids don't, they get sifted out. What's your question, sir? So audio's much better up here. Um, <laughs> so I am a former um, Boston public, public Schools teacher. I taught civics. And um, I think the gentle lady over here was alluding to civics. not wanting to get her riled up again, but something about um, textbooks and so like in, within my experience in my own classroom like there were not enough textbooks civics textbooks to go around so um you also had the issue of ela and math getting more weight more time and so my subject sure. therefore is seen by my colleagues and students as unimportant um so in the age of i guess high stakes testing like how do you convey to students and how do you convey to teachers that all subjects are important not just math in the LA. Ah, that's curriculum. Chip, jump right in. That's curriculum. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> when, when, we, when we provide for each good public school what the very best funded, best maintained public schools has, then you start to level the playing field the playing field for students. Many of our teachers start off behind, uh, both in training and in support <coughs> services and in expectations. I don't think it matters so much where you live um, as what you do where you go to work. Because people, I don't care where you live, you can live out in the, you want to drive from New Hampshire to Boston, fine. I got somebody in my staff comes from Kennebunk, Maine, every day to work and does a fabulous job. There are people around the corner, got the wrong attitude, you know, slipping and sliding. I don't think there's any one answer to good public education, but we do know how to do it. That was what Ron Edmonds' More Effective Schools movement was about. We know how to do a good job. Whether or not we have the political will to do it and we're ready to put the resources behind it, behind the teachers, the students, their parents, the whole infrastructure, how you pay for it. This is, we're talking about tax reform now because that's something that uh, the legislature has, I think, in um, the person who's in charge of financing now, Jay Kaufman of Lexington. He's really looking at how we collect taxes and where it goes. And the largest job any school, any city has, anywhere in the country, small hamlet, it's to educate the children, the next generation. That's your major job. Health care, hey, I'm, I'm all for that. We, we need good health care as opposed to just health insurance. But you, of all things, have to make sure that the money you collect in taxes does support and maintain effort at what goes on in the classroom, 
the repair of the buildings, the education of the teachers, the, just all the resources, the transportation. It's safe to go to school on a bus. Mm -hmm. But it, I also, we're not talking about here, but I would love to see a much better physical education program for public school children like you have. In, I want to see them on the um, Charles River. We have a rowing pool at Madison Park that never gets used. Mm -hmm. We have. We need for sabbaticals for our teachers, paid sabbaticals. We need a, a year overseas for our language students so they can learn to use that language in another country like they do with Brown and Nichols and Noble and Greeno. And uh, I have a girl right in Roxbury who went to Thailand from Wayland High School. She's now a PhD in the Boston Police Department. So you don't know what you're going to turn out when you become a citizen. What's your question? Um, well, my, it's actually more so a comment than a question. Um, well, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Joanne Pierum, and I actually know Chip. Chip was a great mentor to me while I was in college and before. Um, but college, yes, I did ah, go to Spelman. Atlantic City College. Um, but before, I'm originally from Boston, about four generations in the city. Um, but I was living in Atlanta, and after graduating from Spelman, I actually had the opportunity to teach for two years. So. I'd like to consider myself an agent for educational change at this young point in my life. But um, in saying that, um, my, my first year I taught um, for a pre-K program in a Head Start facility. Um, after that, I had the opportunity I, to- I really have to ask you to, if, to get to your question because oh, yeah. we're over time I'm sorry. now. And yeah, I got it'll be very, it. very quick. Thank after you. that, I had the opportunity to work for strategic planning for Atlanta Public Schools. And, formatting a curriculum for their pre-kindergarten program. In doing that, they modeled the curriculum of Boston Public Schools. And I find it very interesting when the young lady stated the statistics of the, the percentage of high school graduates in this city. And we're used, this city is used as a forerunner um, with other cities' education systems. And I think what happens is because I'm, I'm sure people are knowledgeable of that fact that work in administration, and because of that, I think it becomes a, a mentality of complacentism. So with, with that, there's not a, a push for high ex, higher expectations within the, the, within the education system. Okay. Thank you. So, thank thank you. you. Um, we're over time. I'd like to wrap up with one last question for the panel, and if you could give us some short answers, that would be great. <laughs> If we're always in a state of reform, yeah. do we ever get to where we're trying to go? Ask that of Detroit. Does this year's cars look like last year's? <laughs> no, because it's always a better widget. Okay. And that doesn't, that doesn't negate the literature, the language, Angela's ashes. Mm -hmm. the, You've got to get kids to have generous enthusiasms or hobbies that carry them for the rest of their life, even if they go to jail, mm -hmm. or even if they're sick. It's what's in between here that'll hold you more than anything else you know, the words. And I am so grateful that the Boston schools made us memorize a lot of the great poets and <laughs> the soliloquies from Hamlet and Macbeth and all that. And then it opens up Nazim Hikmet from Turkey, don't live in this world like a renter. It opens up language in any culture. And I wish one other thing. I wish they teach geography again. Yes. I Chip. spell Afghanistan. A G. -E. I'll, I'll <laughs> close at the end. Please, Chip. Okay. Tessa, I, I had a professor who said that you know we had a constitutional convention a couple of hundred years ago, and now the argument is whether we, we settled everything in education. The constitutional convention continues That's and right. is never finished, yes. and education is a quest. And we're only a, only a part way towards That's achieving right. the utopia that That's all right. of us want. Claudia. Sisyphus. Mm -hmm. Claudio. In the last 20 years, I went to way too many funerals of young people oh, in this city. Um, and there are mornings I wake up and, uh, you know, I, I feel pretty down about the state of things. But I think uh, Dr. Cronin reminded us at the end of uh, his book with a mm -hmm. hopeful note that a lot of good things have happened. And we seem to be in a trajectory of good progress. And change is a good thing. We should keep changing and changing and changing. And just have solid principles. But we cannot stop change. We may not read the way we used to read. I will argue that we are facing a new generation that I call the uh, post-alphabetic generation. These are mm -hmm. kids that will learn 
in very different ways That's that we right. did. And That's it may right. not be through the traditional uh, reading and writing, but it will be learning uh, nevertheless. And we should not get a stock either, and we should experiment. I'm so excited right now of all the technology that our young people are using. And I think as we go forward with the reform efforts, um, is that we must look at the power of what kids talking about the iPad and also the indi uh, these individual assistants and all these things that they're all touching and buttons and all those other things of interaction. Um, I think by using those methods and uh, they're always on their hip and on their arms and all, all over the place, I think we can get there. You know, and uh, it's interesting, um, and uh, we really need to go back to the classics as well. I want kids to know about the Merchant of Venice. I remember I said that, and they said, where's that? So, I mean, <laughs> we really have to get back to the basics of, 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 of education and the great works, and um, I'm really forward that we're going to get there. Well, on behalf of the Ford Hall Forum, I'd like to thank our panelists, George Chip Greenwich, Dr. Jean McGuire, Claudio Martinez, and Dr. Joseph Cronin. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank coming. For Please to go us. to, if you're online, go to www.fordhallforum.org and see what's happening in our next series. Thank you very much. This preceding program was brought to you by Suffolk University. Please visit us on the web at www.suffolk.edu.